Welcome to the Boston Medical Library's 43rd Annual Garland Lecture. First of all, I would like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this year's Garland Lecture. I am Rick Peters, the new president of the Boston Medical Library. By, my, by way of introduction, I've been a medical educator and practicing physician my entire career. I'm currently professor of radiation oncology and pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. It is with some trepidation that I step into the enormous shoes of my distinguished predecessor, Dr. J. J. Asankar, who served the BML as president for the past 15 years. This transition has been in the making for a couple of years, and I have the good fortune that Jay will be serving as chair of the board as we move into the next phase of the BML's future. So I hope you will all join me in expressing our gratitude and appreciation for his leadership and commitment these past years. The BML has always been about access to current medical knowledge. This need led to the founding of the first BML in 1805, when a group of physicians got together to share their books and talk shop. That institution did not last long. But the same need and the growing importance of medical journals, particularly from Europe, led to the founding of the second, current, BML in 1875. The BML provided books and journals and opportunities for collegial networking with colleagues, curbside consults, and lectures. With the demise of the physician lounge, the hospital library, and the doctor's dining room, the BML seems even more needed now for library services, networking, and collegiality. Tonight's lecture continues the tradition of scholarly talks under the auspices of the Boston Medical Library. So now I will turn the podium over to Dr. Dale McGee, the chair of the Garland Lecture Committee, who will share some background on Joe Garland and introduce this year's speaker. Dale? Thanks. Hi, everybody. I am going to start by just giving us a few words about Dr. Garland uh, himself. The, uh, Dr. Garland was a pediatrician who first became involved with what was then the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal in 1924. Uh, this was subsequently, as you know, renamed the New England Journal of Medicine, and, and that occurred in 1928. And he rose to editor in 1947, uh, retiring from that role in 1968. During this time, he oversaw the transition of the journal from just a regional medical journal to the international journal that we know today, uh, quadrupling their subscription base, introducing new topics, including humanism and uh, policy that were not previously addressed by the journal. So he was an innovator, and he also just uh, was able to magnify the influence of the journal. Uh, he also acted as president of the Boston Medical Library from 1967 to 1970, so another connection with us here today. Uh, he passed away in 1973, and the Garland Lecture was subsequently uh, established, and the first one was uh, delivered in 1976. So each year, uh, we are charged with choosing topics and choosing speakers. And first of all, I'd like to thank those uh, on our selection committee uh, whose great ideas and constructive comments uh, made this year's choice uh, uh, possible. And I'd also like to let everyone know that uh, we were very fortunate to actually get our first choice uh, for our speaker today. We're absolutely delighted to have Dr. Jha here. Now, today's topic, why is U.S. healthcare spending so high and what can we do about it, uh, was chosen by Dr. Jha uh, when he accepted the uh, invitation. Dr. Jha received his MD from Harvard Medical School and then trained in internal medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. He completed his general medicine fel fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital and received a Master's of Public Health from the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Jha was elected as a member of the National Academy of Medicine in 2013. He is a professor both at the School of Public Health and at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on improving quality and the cost of healthcare systems, especially by looking at the impact of policy changes. Dr. Jha has published over 200 papers and writes regularly about ways to improve uh, our healthcare systems. 
Welcome, Dr. Zhao. Thank you. Thank you, Dale, and um, good evening, everybody. It's an enormous pleasure and honor to give the Garland Lecture, and, and not just because of who Dr. Garland was and how he transformed medicine and medical journals and uh, scholarly work uh, in our community, but also the previous speakers who've gone before me. So uh, I am very grateful to have had the opportunity. Thank you for having me here. Um, my hope for this evening is to have an interactive discussion about why American healthcare spending is what it is. And um, what I want to do is walk you through what I think are the narratives, the stories we have told ourselves about American healthcare. And I want to show you data and evidence. And from that, my hope is that we can update our narratives. We can update our stories um, based on what the evidence actually tells us. And the one thing I promise you is I don't have any solutions. So when I say, you know, what can we do about this? How do we understand the value? There are no ready-made solutions because every solution comes with trade-offs and challenges. But it is clear to me that we're not going to make progress unless we agree on the basic set of facts, unless we agree on the data that's in front of us, and then and, and unless we agree that there are going to be trade-offs, no matter which policy approach we take. So let me get started. And before I get into the, the meat of the talk, I want to take a moment to acknowledge someone named Uwe Reinhardt. How many of you have heard of Uwe Reinhardt? Yeah, so Uwe um, was a colleague, a friend, a mentor. Um, he passed away recently, just about a year ago. He was an economist at Princeton. And he didn't just inspire the work I'm going to talk about. He really instigated it. About a year and a half ago, um, through a converse, set of conversations between him, Howard Bachner, who's the editor-in-chief of JAMA, um, the regional journal from Chicago, as we call it. Um, <laughs> uh, I just had to get that in. Um, Howard, Uwe, and I talked about the importance of this work and that it was time for us to update uh, a seminal paper that he had initially done almost 20 years ago. And when we were working on this, um, Uwe was a tough critic. He was a kind and gentle man, but he was also very difficult if you try to get sloppy data by him. He wasn't having any of it. And so we wrote the paper for him, because we knew he was going to be our primary reviewer. And just as the paper finished and we were about to submit it, um, he became acutely ill, developed sepsis, and passed away. So um, this work really, as I said, not just inspired by it, but instigated by, by Uwe. And I felt like I couldn't talk about this uh, without acknowledging his important role. So here's what I'm going to try to cover over the next hour and 50 minutes. And as I said, um, it's going to be interactive. So we know we spend a lot on healthcare. And I want to talk about why we spend so much on healthcare. And really, why do we spend so much more than others? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about trade-offs, as I have mentioned. I want to talk about quality and outcomes. And how do we think about all of this in the international context? So I'm going to start off with some things that you've all seen, heard 50 times. And here's one piece of data. You've all seen a version of this slide, which is this is healthcare spending 2016. Um, this is percentage of the economy, percentage of GDP. Here's America. And it takes no genius to know that we are the outliers. Here's the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, Sweden, France, Netherlands, Switzerland, Denmark, Canada, Japan, and Australia. And I want to make a couple of points on this. First of all, I assume everybody has seen some version of this slide. We are truly exceptional when it comes to healthcare spending. We spend more than any other industrialized country. Second is that these are not just other random countries. They are large. They're also very wealthy countries. And so here, we're comparing ourselves to the wealthiest, most prosperous nations in the world, mostly Western European, but also others. And the last point I want to make is if America was not on this slide, what you would notice is quite a bit of variation. Switzerland is the outlier. Switzerland spends more on healthcare than anybody else, except for us. But there is a good amount of variation across countries, but it gets dwarfed when you put America in. And so that'll be important because it turns out there is no European health system. We often say, you know, if we do what the Europeans did, it turns out Europe is not a country. And the Swiss system looks very different from the British system, which looks very different from the German system. 
and the French system looks different yet. And that'll be important when we think about our own solutions. So that's the kind of framing slide. So the next question, of course, is why? And there are a couple of ways of thinking about the why question. But what I mean by why is this. Why do we spend so much more? Not why are we at 18%, but why are we so much more? If you look at us compared to all of Europe, we're about twice as, all, twice as much. So why are we twice as much? That's the question, and that's what I want to spend the next 25, 30 minutes teasing apart, okay? Let me just tell you about the paper that we published. This was the one that I described. Um, and I'm going to just take one minute to give you the approach behind this paper. Um, and the approach was this. We began by comparing ourselves to other 10 other very high-income countries, as I suggested. The data source we used was the OECD. I, I'm going to assume that many of you know what the OECD is, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's a multilateral organization made up of, it's, it's a club of high-income countries. About 30 countries make up the OECD, and these are countries that share data. So most of the data comes from national sources, national statistics, et cetera. And then here's the last part, the real work behind this paper. Because I'm going to share some data with you that you're going to struggle with, and I suspect you're going to wonder if it's right. Because we wondered if it was right when we first saw it. And our approach was we went back, not just to the OECD, but to the original country statistics offices. In each of the countries, we had colleagues and friends who were experts. We went back to them. We shared with them their data and said, could this possibly be right? And when there was disagreement, we brought people together. We tried our best to verify and get the data right. And so I am not suggesting that everything I present to you is perfect. What I am suggesting is I don't know how to do it any better than the way we did it. And I think these represent the best data for international comparisons that certainly we could put together, OK? So if the question we're going to answer is, why do we spend so much more on healthcare? Here's the only equation of the day. And I'm going to spend 30 seconds walking you through this equation, because this is the fundamental equation that I believe in our, our policymakers have not understood. Total spending is quantity times price. Okay, So let's go through that. If I tell you that I spend twice as much on donuts as one of you, there are two ways I could be spending twice as much on donuts. I could really like donuts, and I just buy twice as many donuts as you. Or I actually eat the same number of donuts that you do, but I really like gourmet donuts, and they're priced twice as high, or some combination thereof. Right? But if I'm spending twice as much on, on donuts as you are, I'm either buying more donuts, or I'm buying pricier donuts, or a combination. Everybody agree with that? That's really the only way to get there. So the hypothesis that's been out there that people have, have argued is that the problem is quantity. The problem is our culture of overuse. That Americans just are, they, they over-medicalize everything, they go to the doctor right away. That our doctors are greedy, that the fee-for-service system makes them want to do all sorts of extra stuff, and that's the problem of American healthcare. And that narrative is well-heeled, well-described, and I want to see what the data tell us. So one way to examine this is to say, well, let's look at the fact that maybe we are quick to go to the doctor. The moment somebody gets a little pain in the back, a little scratch on the head, we're heading to the doctor. That's been a narrative. So we looked at the data on that, and here's what we see. Across these countries, this is annual visits to the doctor per capita. The average is 6.6. .6. Here's the United States at four. The average American goes to the doctor four times a year. The average individual living in one of these other countries goes to the doctor 6.6 .6 times. By the way, very interesting, Japan, 13 visits a year. The average Japanese sees his or her doctor more than once a month. It's a lot of contact between the patient and the doctor. Um, but here we are. And at least when it comes to doctor visits, we look like we actually may not be using the physician so much. So that's interesting. And when people look at this data, they say, oh, actually, 
The problem may be that we don't have enough doctor visits. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean too many. Maybe the answer is it's not enough. And that means we don't have enough prevention and not enough primary care, and this leads to too many hospitalizations. Well, that would make sense, right? Maybe we, should, we went to the doctor more, we wouldn't spend so much time in the hospital. So the next theory has been that patients in America just, we spend a lot more time in the hospital. So we said, let's look at that. And here's what that data tells us. And the average across these countries is 149 hospital discharges per population, and we're about 15% less than average. So certainly when, it looks, when we look at number of hospitalizations per population, it doesn't look like we're spending a lot of time in the hospital, not compared to these other countries. The other interesting fact, a few other reflections on this slide. Um, one is Germany, really quite an outlier. A lot of hospitalizations happening in Germany. The other reflection is a hospitalization is not a hospitalization. There's also the issue of length of stay. How many days do you spend in the hospital? Which country do you all think has the shortest length of stay? Where do people spend, for each hospitalization, the least number of days? US. The US. The US, right? So when you combine fewer hospitalizations with fewer hospital days per hospitalization, you end up with Americans spending a lot less time in the hospital than individuals in other countries. The average hospitalization length, the length of stay for a patient with pneumonia in America, anybody know? What's that? Three? Yeah, three, three and a half. In the Medicare population is four, but it's in the three to four range. The average length of stay for a pneumonia patient in Japan, any guesses? Yeah, it's about 14. Whoever said 14 over there, thank you. Yeah, about 14, right? If you think about pneumonia and you do a 10-day course of antibiotics, four days of IV and six days of oral, you're watching the patient four days after the antibiotics have stopped. It's a different model. But the point is, it's a lot of variation in, in lengths of stay. But when it comes to hospital use, we actually seem to be on the low end of things, both in terms of number of hospitalizations and the number of days per hospitalization. Let me share a couple more pieces of data, and then I'll stop and I'll take some questions. So then people have come back and said, well, OK, so maybe the doctor visits are not a problem, and maybe it's not hospitalizations, but it's all those tests and procedures. And here, this data sort of does support some of these hypotheses. So let's look at MRIs, MRIs per population. And here's what we see. Here's the mean, and here's us. It does seem like we're a little bit on the high end. We're about 30% you know, higher than the average. Here's Germany again, by the way right at that high end. I don't know what's going on in Germany. Um, maybe that's because they make all the MRI machines, right, Siemens, and <laughs> so, it, so it's, it's easier. You can just, you don't even have to ship it. Um, but, the, but the point is, yes, we're a little bit on the high side on, on MRIs. Not twice as high. Remember, we've got twice the spending, so it seems funny that that would be the thing. What if we move on from MRIs to procedures, so knee replacements? Now here we look really high. Right? We're clearly on the outlier end of things. Um, what's the major reason why people need knee replacements? I'm sorry? Osteoarthritis. osteoarthritis. And what's the number one risk factor for osteoarthritis? Obesity. Obesity. And, uh, and age, for whoever said age. We have much higher rates of obesity in our population than, than any of these countries. And so it's not a total surprise that the number of knee replacements per population is higher here. What was interesting to me when I saw it, and a little surprising actually, is I expected a similar pattern for hip replacement and didn't quite see it. On hip replacement, we're actually a little below average. And here is Switzerland and Germany again coming in on the high end. And last one on this. I could keep going all day with more and more procedures, but I will, I will move on. This is going to be a last one. Coronary angioplasty is one that has gotten a lot of attention as one that we think we overuse. People talk about overuse of angioplasty a lot. So we were interested in how do we compare to other countries. And here, we're a little bit on the high end. What's interesting is this, which is sure, we're a little bit on the high end. We're about 10, 15% higher. Same level as the Netherlands. Marginally different than France. Well below Germany. Again, not sure. Germany has a lot of utilization. Um, but the point here 
is this. If the hypothesis was that the problem of American healthcare is greedy doctors, patients who are entitled, too much healthcare utilization, and by the way, the too much healthcare utilization comes from both the political left and the political right. The political left talks about this in terms of physicians are incentivized to do too much. The political right says the problem is people are too insured and they don't have enough skin in the game and therefore they immediately go to the doctor, immediately get tests and procedures that they shouldn't. We should be seeing very high utilization rates. And my read of the data is that higher US costs are not primarily about utilization. We have fewer hospitalizations, fewer doctor visits. Come on in. Um, tests and procedures are a mixed bag. We do more of some things, fewer of others. And this is my bottom line, and you can have a different interpretation. But the way I think about it is we are above average on some things, we're below average on other things, and on average, we're pretty average. <laughs> Let me take a moment to pause there um, and maybe just make one more comment. Much of American health policy in the last 10 years, certainly under the ACA, Obamacare, has been about focusing on overutilization, has been focusing on trying to reduce healthcare use. I'm not arguing there isn't overutilization, I'm just arguing it's not a uniquely American problem. And I have lots of other data studies I can point to, whether you look at end of life care, whether you look at almost anything. We're pretty average on utilization. And last year, I had a chance to present some of the preliminary data to, um, uh, at the National Governors Association to health secretaries from, so one, the governors, but the health secretaries. And one of the health secretaries raised her hand at the end of my talk and said, I feel like I've been lied to all my life. I said, I'm not sure who's been lying to you. And she said, the narrative has been overutilization, overutilization, that we're different because you, we use too much. That's not what the data seems to show, at least not my interpretation of the data. Um, and on utilization, it seems to me at least that we're pretty average across these high income countries. Let me, um, before I move on to the next issue, let me see if people have questions, comments, disagreements, um, pushback on any of that. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever looked at like readmission rates? Like sure. Trends on like sure. So readmission rates are higher, but total number of hospital days are still much lower, much, much lower than almost any of the other countries. And readmission rates are a little bit of a trade-off. So if you keep, keep the patient with pneumonia in the hospital for 14 days, there's almost no chance that that person's going to get readmitted because they've been well for a week, <laughs> right? Um, whereas if you send them home on day four, there's a small chance they'll end up coming back. And that's the trade-off. So absolutely other countries have lower readmission rates, but if you look at total hospital use rates, we're, we're on the low end of things. Let me take a few more questions. Yes, ma'am. The first slide shows cost relative to GDP. Yes. Do, does the percentage look similar in, in your comparison if you use per capita? It's a great question. Um, because GDP in some ways normalizes what the underlying economy is doing. And so I could have shown you per capita spending, and it would look about the same. Uh, you know, we're obviously on the high end of GDP. Certainly in the world we are, or we're among the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, but Switzerland, Denmark, these are countries with high GDP per capita as well. So if I showed you per capita spending, if I showed you per capita spending adjusted for purchasing power parity, the, the story would be the same. It would be the same. We are outliers. We spend a lot more. OK, other questions? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, but CTs and knee and, and, all the, and, 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 and smaller yep. uh, blood studies yep. and that sort. Is, have you you've looked at those? We've looked at, a, and then the patterns are similar. And the patterns are that when it comes to diagnostic tests, MRIs, CTs, we're a bit on the high end. We're definitely on the high end. Below Germany, but on the high end. Um, but when it comes to procedures, we're above average on some and about average on others. And the the point is when you look across the broad swath of stuff, everything that goes into healthcare, 
it's really hard to see the picture of overutilization as the explanation, right? If you squint the right way, you can say, I think we have a little more of this. Sure. That doesn't explain twice the spending. Up there, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. What about the cost of treatment and overutilization of prescription drugs? Or Great. So um, I'm going to get to prescription drugs in a short bit, but let me just say that if you look at prescription drug utilization per population, we're a little below average, um, certainly in primary care. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say we looked at it from two decades ago. Yeah. Before managed care, yep. insurance companies yep. started really cracking down. Yeah. Was it still no, really no different? Still pretty average? You know, I wish I could. I wish I could give you a, a, an evidence base and a, and a thoughtful answer on that. Um, these are uh, certainly national trends have changed over time. When when we've had the rise of managed care, there was no doubt a clamping down on utilization. Then as managed care kind of faded into the late 90s, early 2000s, there was an uptick again of utilization. Uh, I would argue that there's, again, probably been a little slowdown. What's interesting is two things. Um, some of it is driven by these policy changes. Some of it is driven by innovation. New treatments come out and people start using them. And all these other countries have been going through their own policy cycles. And so I could take a cut point, any point in the last three decades, and things would shift around a little bit. Maybe Switzerland was on a high move and we were on the low end. So you'll see that, but there's no, when it comes to utilization, I don't see any American exceptionalism. I don't see America looking very different from everybody else. I see us kind of in the middle of these high income countries, of the wealthiest countries. Let me take one more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hospitals are very concerned about length of stay, push people out fast into rehab yep. and uh, nursing homes. And I understand that those chronic care uh, parts of our healthcare are a huge part of our cost. They are. Um, they are, uh, and they've been a growing part of our cost, so it's a very important point. Um, you know, other countries are, because other countries generally have an older population than us, these other countries, um, they're struggling with a lot of the same kinds of issues. Um, so they, and again, every country is different, so Japan deals with it by just keeping people in the hospital longer, whereas we send people out to rehab faster. From a cost point of view, it's not clear that we're doing the more high cost thing, because rehabs tend to be a little cheaper than hospitals. That's why we do it. But it, it wouldn't explain the higher spending here. But I agree with you that those pattern differences really are very stark. And you do see them between us and a lot of other countries. OK, I'm going to keep moving unless, OK, one more. You, 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 you persuaded me. Yeah. Throat, cancer, transplantation. Yeah. So that's a very fair point, and I, I have two thoughts on it. One is I'm going to show you in a little bit some data on outcomes, because there we get into some of that. Um, but it's very, it has been until now very hard to get national statistics on those things, because that's, those data just have not been previously collected. So I'm only showing you things that we actually have comparable data for. That said, um, in three months, we're, so we're right now working with, the, with partners in each of these countries to do exactly what you're suggesting. Look at care patterns, complex, sick, high-cost patients, and we're working on that analysis. And I wish I had an answer for you. I would say in three months, we'll have a, a, an empirically driven answer for what that looks like. I, I could make something up right now, but I but probably ought not to uh, for all obvious reasons. Okay. So I'm going to just very quickly talk about hypothesis number two, which in many ways is related to hypothesis number one, but is certainly something people talk quite a bit about, which is this idea that American healthcare is a specialist-driven healthcare system. We have too many specialists, not enough primary care. And I'd be very surprised if you haven't heard that theory before. It is in almost every health policy talk. Uh, this, is, uh, this is discussed and trodden out. So we thought, well, this is an empirical question. We should be able to look and see what proportion of our doctors are primary care versus specialists and how it compares to other countries. So here's what we find. And what we find is across these countries, this is proportion of doctors who are primary care. Um, here it is on the, on the y-axis. France is at 54%. Uh, Denmark kind of brings in the low end at 22%. 
and here is the average across these countries at 43, and here's the US at 43, and here's Australia and Germany and UK and Netherlands, and they're all a little bit higher. But I think you'll agree with me that these numbers don't look dramatic. And on average, we're pretty average when it comes to primary care. This has probably been the single biggest surprise for me. When we, before we started this work, I'd given versions of this talk where I often said one of the differences between us and the Europeans is that we are much more specialist driven, a much higher proportion of our doctors are specialists. I'm not sure I know why I said that, because it turns out I was saying something that wasn't true. Um, but you know, this has been sort of the hardest part of the work because everybody defines primary care a little differently. Some countries use terms like general practitioners and others use family practitioners. So they're just different definitions. And we spent an enormous amount of time trying to get to functionality. What do doctors actually do in their time when they're in clinic? What kind of patients are they seeing? Can we get to apples to apples? I am not arguing that we got to perfect apples to apples comparison. I think we have a comparison of like Red Delicious versus Macintosh. They're all apples. Our definitions are slightly different, but we're getting to pretty comparable data here. And this has created quite a bit of consternation among a lot of advocates of primary care. I'm a general internist. So my general internist friends have been very uh, upset about some of the, these data suggesting. But this does not mean we couldn't do better with more primary care. It just means that our primary care specialty mix isn't the explanation for our higher healthcare spending. It can't be, because we're pretty average. Before I move on, let me take a, any reflections on this. Because as I said, this is the one that has probably bothered people the most. Yes, sir. Yes. We have a lot of nurse practitioners. Yeah. So that's a very good question, and we spent some amount of time trying to get at that. Um, we, we just couldn't get comparable data. My gestalt, so now I'm going, moving from data to gestalt, and you'll, you'll excuse me on that, um, is that there's a good amount of mid-level use in other countries as well. Um, but we just could not get to comparable data on how much other countries are using. Any other question? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, sir. Including gynecologists, they count themselves as primary. They do. In our analysis, we are not. In our, uh, can, and, and we don't in other countries as well. Just trying to get to apples to apples. So our general approach on these things was to say, how do we get to the most comparable data? How do we get to the most comparable data? And that's the approach. So it seems surprisingly not about uh, primary care specialty mix. Was there another? Yes, sir. So in the United States, is the, the their metric to use at a national level, but as such, uh, individuals with, you know, sort of plans to and a range where the doctor can have this and so forth. Yeah. Maybe this is just a merger where the range could be from zero to uh, I it, it is an, your question is actually an enormously important one. And let me take 30 seconds and, and, and try to get, uh, do it justice. Um, Denmark lovely place, five million people. Massachusetts, anybody know the population of Massachusetts? Six and a half. They're about 25, 30% larger than Denmark. So when I compare America to Denmark, what am I comparing? And that is very complicated. And these are averages, but so are the spending numbers, they're averages. And the bottom line is, actually, if you, if you will indulge me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on the bottom line of, of this for about 10 more minutes, because I want to show you some more data that gets at this. So just indulge me on that. We're going to come back to this issue. Okay? I'm going to keep going. So if it's not about utilization and specialty mix, what is it about? And here, I want to talk about administrative waste. The reason why administrative waste is very much a theory and it's something that is, is that in about three weeks we're about to have an election. You all know about it. We're going to have the midterms. And more or less the day after the midterms, we'll begin the 2020 presidential election. Right? A whole group of Democrats are going to announce in the weeks that follow. And the single biggest health policy discussion we are going to have is Medicare for all, single payer, because much of the Democratic Party has gotten behind that idea. And the biggest argument that they make for single payer is that they say these systems that we have in the United States 
are administratively extremely wasteful, inefficient. So administrative waste seems like an important issue for us to look at. So here's what we find when we look at administrative waste. And here we find some good evidence that we really are outliers. Now, administrative waste can be defined in lots of different ways. This is how the OECD defines it, which is basically the cost of administering the health insurance system, whether it's public, private. And what we find is that across the OECD countries, it's about 3%, and here we are at 8%. What's interesting to me is that the Netherlands and Switzerland are two relatively private systems with primarily private insurance, and they are about half of our administrative costs. So for those who think that this is about public versus private only, I will argue there are plenty of ways of having a private system that's much more efficient. We have a mix of public and private that is extremely inefficient when it comes to administration. And I'm happy to get into the details of what that is, but if you've ever practiced medicine in America, you know exactly what that is, <laughs> right? Even I, so these days my clinical practice is at the VA, and so I am I'm spared some of the madness. But even I am not spared all of the madness. Uh, the administrative uh, inefficiencies of our healthcare system are real. Um, the only point I would make is empirically what we find is that both public systems can be much more efficient and private systems can be much more efficient than where we are. So this is clearly part of what's going on. Um, okay. But it's obviously not the whole story, because it's only a small part of the healthcare system. So that same equation that I put up before, let me come back to it. So if I have argued, and you may or may not believe me, but if I have argued that quantity doesn't seem to be the dominant issue, then maybe price is the dominant issue. Because I said to you that these are the only two things that make up this. So let's talk about prices. It's the prices. That's the famous paper by Uwe Reinhardt that I started with. In 2003, he wrote a paper called It's the Prices Stupid. It's quite, quite, a, quite a charming title. Um, so prices of what? So if you've paid any attention to the news today, what was in the news all day today um, that President Donald J. Trump has now announced a whole new initiative to lower prices of? Drugs, pharmaceuticals. That's been the topic. That's been the topic du jour. For months and months, we've been talking about the prices of pharmaceuticals. So the question is, is that really a thing? The answer is yeah. Here's mean spending on pharmaceuticals. Here's us. And I already told somebody who asked me from around here about whether we use more pharmaceuticals. And I said, we don't use more pharmaceuticals. It's just our pharmaceutical prices seem to be higher. And if you pick a couple of specific pharmaceuticals, and we have data on about 50 of them, and so again, I could bore you for an hour on just individual pharmaceutical prices, but the story is very similar, whether it's a month of Crestor, it's Humira, no matter which pharmaceutical you look at, almost all of them, the prices are much higher here. We can talk about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and what the trade-offs are, but there is no doubt about it that prices of pharmaceuticals are much higher. Here's the one problem with focusing a lot on pharmaceuticals which is that pharmaceuticals make up 15% of our healthcare spending, right? Pharma companies say actually it's only 10%, but they don't want to count things like the pharmaceuticals that we administer in physician offices or in hospitals. So if you really count all the pharmaceuticals that we use as a country, we're probably at about 15% of all healthcare spending. Even if you're spending twice as much on 15%, you can't get twice as much on the whole thing. There's gotta be more to it than pharmaceuticals. That can't be the whole story. Here's physician salaries. This is where I usually lose my physician friends crowd. So let me, <laughs> let me just get through the next five minutes before anybody throws any darts at me. Um, physician salaries. Here are generalist physician salaries. Here's the mean. And here's us. I know what you guys are thinking. What about medical school debt, which is real, and the most uh, my favorite health economist after Uwe um, is Sherry Gleed, who's the dean of the Wagner School at NYU, but one of the most brilliant economists in the country. And she's done some really nice work that shows that medical school debt probably explains about a $20,000 difference in salaries. So that's not the whole explanation. We do pay our generalists more. And it's not just generalists. It's also specialists. And what's interesting on the specialist side 
is while the specialist salaries in the US are much higher, um, the variation is also much bigger. We have some specialists who get paid six, eight hundred thousand, a million dollars a year. That almost never happens in these other countries. So it's not just an average, the variation here is quite substantial. And, and in Canada and the Netherlands, you don't see that. The big point is uh, physicians in these other countries are often middle class or slightly above middle class. Our physicians are just better paid. And I'm gonna come back to why that's important and what the implications are. But I just wanna make the point that it's not just doctors. And I could literally go through every profession in the healthcare field and the pattern would be the same. Our professionals get paid more. What about other stuff beyond physician salaries? And now let me take a minute to just show you, this is no longer from the OECD, this is from the International Federation of Health Plans. This is about prices paid for different tests. Here's the CAT scan of the abdomen. By the way, look at Spain, $85. I mean, my take is we should all get on a plane, go to Barcelona, <laughs> have some paella, and if you get a little abdominal pain, no big deal, <laughs> right? Because 85 bucks, that's like cheaper than a meal. Um, the other interesting part of it is Switzerland. Anybody been to Switzerland? Cheap country, right? Really cheap, like everything there is. I was in Geneva maybe three weeks ago and I went to a Starbucks. Um, got a grande latte, you know, medium latte. Didn't even get any vanilla shots or anything extra on it. Anybody have a sense of how much I paid for my grande latte at Starbucks in Geneva? Yeah, about nine bucks. And I hadn't had breakfast, I threw in a bagel and cream cheese, which was another $8, and it was close to 20 for a latte and a bagel. Geneva's a really expensive town. Except their, their abdominal CTs are much cheaper. Here's an appendectomy. This is the average payment in the US. Oops, yeah, I can just keep going. Knee replacement. Story's the same. Bypass surgery. Um, you know, maybe we can't do it at Spain prices. But it's interesting, we should be able to do it at Switzerland prices. Right, because Switzerland is not some cheap place where, but, but our prices are much higher. So before I get into trade-offs on this, let me see if there are reflections, questions, comments on this. I have a question. Yes. Uh, the prices you're quoting, does that include the doctor as well as the hospital? It's all in. Oh, everything there. Yeah. Okay. As best as we can. Every, every country has slightly different payment systems. We have slightly different payment systems, right? Like the way we do bundle payments versus capitated payments. So these are best efforts to try to get to, to, to comparable. Okay, yes, sir, Scott. Do you have any historical data on how when that shift occurred? Yeah. Maybe this 25 years ago was the same kind of ratio? It is a very good question. There's a very nice piece in the New York Times that Austin Fract wrote, um, where if you look from 1965 to 1980, American healthcare spending compared to these other countries, we're right in the middle. And then around 82, 83, we start going up. And everybody else goes up, but then we diverge, diverge, diverge. And it has been a track that has just stayed. And so the prices seem to start changing in the early to mid 80s. And he went back, it was a New York Times piece that was really quite good, Fract, F-R-A-K-T, wrote it. Um, went back and talked to a lot of historians to try to figure out what, what happened in the, in the early 80s. And it has two pieces in the Times, so two piece series that's quite good trying to explore that. But that's the timeline that we think, sometime in the early 80s. Last question, then I'll, I want to move on. Yes, sir. Are we worth in other words, I, I am. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a joke. Clear. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> that was a joke. In, in, I find. in terms of outcomes, not general kinds of outcomes, but specific outcomes in relationship to complex kinds. You are setting up my net last 10 minutes beautifully, so I appreciate that question, and I'm not going to answer it because I'm going to answer it in about five minutes. Um, by the way, so I do want to say high prices have, have some trade-offs, pharmaceutical innovations, we dominate new uh, chemical entities, and there is no doubt about it that we get some of the best doctors and nurses, faster access to MRIs, nicer hospital rooms. Here's the key point. If you're a senior college student in America, you're not trying to decide, do I become a doctor in America or do I become a doctor in Sweden? That's not your trade-off. Your trade-off is, do I become a doctor in America or do I become a lawyer in America? Do I go work at Wall Street? Do I go to McKinsey and become a consultant? We generally pay our professionals a lot more. Our lawyers are paid better than the lawyers in Europe. 
our consultants are paid better on average. And so if we were to have physician salaries that match the salaries of other countries, we would get a dramatically different pool of people going into medicine. And so it would not be without trade-offs if we would try to lower physician salaries. I'm going to talk about health outcomes. This is the classic health outcomes slide that everybody uses. Life expectancy, right? Here we are. We're spending twice as much, and look at us. We're way behind everybody else. Here's Japan. Maybe we should be spending two weeks for a pneumonia, <laughs> right? I, quick side story on this. About five years ago, I was in Japan, and I went to visit uh, a hospital. And uh, I walked into the wards. And yeah, I've spent a lot of time in hospitals. I know wards. And I saw these four women sitting around playing cards. They didn't look like they were working there, but I wasn't sure what was going on. So I asked the physician who was with me. And they said, oh, yeah, they're all hospitalized patients. They're just they're resting up before they go home. And they look great, you know? And they're, here they were. They were playing cards, laughing. And I just thought, like, this would not happen in an American hospital. Those people would have gone home 10 days earlier. So um, that's the length of stay story. But here we are, life expectancy. Boy, we're really on the low end. And we talk about that a lot. Here is the other slide I want to bring up on life expectancy that I think is worth thinking. I have dropped America from the slide. And I have added in three more bars, and I have not labeled them yet. And I'm hoping you guys might tell me what those three bars are. States. They are states. Hawaii, Minnesota, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Here's what's interesting. You want Sweden? We've got Sweden. It's called Minnesota. <laughs> Literally, right? Literally, we have Sweden, because a lot of Minnesotans come from Scandinavia and Sweden. And our life expectancy in Sweden really doesn't look that different. I'm sorry, in Minnesota, it really doesn't look that different from Sweden. And when I showed this slide recently, somebody said, well, the Hawaii thing is all about beaches and how beautiful the beaches are. And I was like, maybe, but Switzerland is like lovely, but doesn't have that many beautiful beaches. I don't think this is a beaches phenomenon, right? This is interesting about population health. And here is Connecticut. And the point is, a point that one of you asked earlier, I think over here, about are we comparing apples to apples when we compare countries? And is it really fair to compare America to Denmark? And I don't know. Like, I don't know the answer to that. I will tell you it's complicated. But if you want to compare Minnesota to Sweden, we can do that. And in fact, Minnesota is well ahead of Denmark on life expectancy. But the problem is we have Minnesota, but we also have Mississippi. And the life expectancy and health outcomes in Mississippi look atrocious. And then we have to ask ourselves, do we blame the American health care system for that? Or is it about a totally different set of factors? So hold that thought. And I have about eight minutes. And I want to show you maybe three more slides. And then I'm going to stop and see what final questions you have. Here's neonatal mortality, another one that is often trotted out as a sign that our healthcare system is a mess. Here's the mean, and our mortality rates for neonatal mortality much higher. But here's a different way to look at the same data, which is neonatal mortality given low birth weight. So for those of you who don't know, low birth weight is the primary risk factor for neonatal mortality. And, and low birth weight is driven by all sorts of social factors, smoking, et cetera. And what we find is that here, we're actually pretty good. If you have to have a low birth weight baby, you're more likely to have it here. But if you have it, the chances of that baby surviving are much better. We're really good at high intensity, acute care, severely ill patients. We know how to do that. Breast cancer screening, another area where we think it's, this is important and a system of measure of kind of well-functioning primary care. <coughs> We actually do pretty well. And then last but not least is 30-day stroke mortality. We have more strokes in this country than almost any other country. Japan actually has more. Um, but if you were to have a stroke, where would you like to have it? And our stroke mortality rates are much lower. And it, these data, whether you look at life expectancy and look at us as in terrible shape and as outliers, as among the worst health systems in the world, 
or stroke mortality, we, where we actually look like among the best in the world, raises, I think, fundamental questions of what do you mean when you say the healthcare system? And when you say we have a good health system or a bad health system, what do you mean by that? And what counts? And what's in and what's not? And my point in bringing this up, excuse me, my point in bringing this up is not to argue that stroke counts but life expectancy doesn't. It is that we don't have those conversations. We don't discuss things like social determinants of health. And if we think that being homelessness or, homelessness or being homeless is a really important driver of health outcomes, which it is, then is that the responsibility of the health system to deal with that? So these are fundamental questions that we generally skirt and we get to saying, well, we spend twice as much and have worse health outcomes. And my only point is, that's not, I think, a helpful framework. A helpful framework is to struggle with this, this balance between the fact that we have great health outcomes in Minnesota, terrible health outcomes in Mississippi, and if you're going to have a stroke anywhere, this is a pretty good country to have it in. So that's the, the bulk of it, and I'm gonna, I know I have still about five minutes left. Let me just do my summary slide, and then I'll take any final questions. We have a high healthcare, high cost healthcare system dri driven primarily by administrative costs and prices. Our health outcomes for the population are clearly worse, but if you get sick, this is a pretty good place to do it. And let me finish with that and take more questions for the last five minutes, but thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Would you blend 28 countries with diverse genetics and socioeconomic systems? It seems to me that you could do weighted data to see what the United States of Europe is compared to the United States of America. Yeah. So we could. And if once you get into, and he also, again, it raises all sorts of questions of what's in on Europe and what's not, because to include the entire Eastern European blocs, and, and they have yeah, generally absolutely. much. Because, because you're basically saying, if you're going to include Mississippi, I want the Eastern European countries. I understand that. <laughs> What's that? I was thinking of Albania. Albania, right. If you, right. If you, if, if, if you're, if you want Mississippi, I want Albania. I got it. Um, no, it's true, right? It's interesting because we compare America to places like Denmark. Um, and the Eurozone is about the size of America. And so that would be a good comparison. We just haven't done that. Um, but we have been doing some work thinking about how do we compare individual American states to comparable sized European countries, which I think is a bit more of a fair comparison. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'd like to put a plug in for simple care. You okay. Know, it seems to me that one of the reasons that uh, our healthcare outcomes seem to be poor, in some areas at least, is because they don't have insurance. Yep. That they're not covered. And so it would seem to me if we had a system that was guaranteeing health care for everyone, yep. that that would really be helpful. So um, let me talk about a bit about coverage and the data behind it. Um, so as you know, we made a huge uh, political effort to try to get to universal coverage through the Affordable Care Act. It wasn't a single-payer system, but it was an effort to try to get to, to universal coverage. Um, anybody know what proportion of American population is covered today? What proportion of people have health insurance? Yeah, 91 or 90, depending on whether you look at um, the data from the CDC or you look at um, uh, the polling data. But the bottom line is it's 90, 91%. So we're about a 9 to 10% uninsured rate. What's interesting is to think about who the uninsured are. Um, they are basically made up of three groups of people. About a third of them are relatively young, healthy people in their 20s who are opting out of buying health insurance. Um, I really wish they would buy health insurance because it would help stabilize insurance markets a lot more. But, but that's neither here nor there. Um, a third of them are chronically ill people, generally working poor, who live in states that hasn't expanded Medicaid, right? The Texases of the world. Um, and then a third of them are undocumented workers, people who are here, who've been here for a long time, but who are ineligible for anything that we have, whether it's Medicaid or private insurance. Um, I believe we have to figure out how to get them covered. I believe we have got to figure out how to get all of them covered. I think there's a whole bunch of good reasons to do it. Coverage is a good thing, so you bring up, and I completely agree with you, that getting people covered is good for their health. And there is lots of data in my mind 
to, to back up that assertion. The single payer, there are countries that have single payer systems that are fabulous that do very well. Denmark. So Bernie Sanders, anybody who tracked the 2016 election, you know, Bernie often talked about Denmark. We should do what the Danish people do. Sorry, I'm not going to do a, uh, a Bernie Sanders impression. <laughs> it's not what I get paid for. But, um, but Denmark. What was interesting, going back to Uwe Reinhardt, um, he, was a, he was a total socialist. He was a lefty. He believed in single-payer systems. But what he said about Bernie and Denmark, I thought was very instructive, and it's certainly the way I have thought about it from Uwe, was he said, you know, I will take the Danish health system. It's a fabulous system. I will take the Danish healthcare system, but you must also give me the Danish political system. And it would surely help if you gave me the Danish people. <laughs> and his point was that healthcare systems cannot be removed and divorced from the political system that creates it. And healthcare systems ultimately represent the hopes and aspirations and the values of the people that it serves. And in our country, for better or worse, the things that we value enormously are choice and freedom, the ability to go where you want, when you want. Now that, some people argue, is an illusion. So be it. But that is what Americans say when you ask them what you want out of your healthcare system, they say they want choice. And that leads to a set of political decisions about what we can do, and that has dramatic implications for our healthcare system. So I have no objection to a single payer system. Certainly no, no like I want government out of healthcare. That's, I don't have that objection. What I find when I look at countries around the world is that every system is different. Every system has a history, and they all got to where they got to on their own path. And for me, what that means, and again, you're all allowed to disagree on this, is that whatever solution we come up with is going to have to be a uniquely American solution. And that's how we're going to get to universal coverage. Yeah, you've shown us a little bit of the geographic uh, data in the US. Have yeah. you looked at um, all of these parameters geographically? And are there any states that are, in quotations, getting it right? Um, so, I mean, if you look at things like health outcomes and spending, Minnesota certainly seems to be getting it right. And Connecticut is really good, too. Uh, Massachusetts has excellent health outcomes, but the most expensive healthcare system in the country. I have a caveat on that. Just in the last year, Alaska has surpassed, the United, uh, has surpassed Massachusetts. So now Massachusetts is number two. We were number one on spending. I often used to say, but I can't say it anymore, that the Longwood medical area is the most expensive part of Massachusetts. Massachusetts is the most expensive state in the country, and America is the most expensive country in the world. So we are ground zero for, Amer for healthcare spending. <laughs> but now Alaska has surpassed us, and I don't know what the most expensive part of Alaska is, so it just doesn't work quite as well. Um, but there are states that are, that are doing well. But it brings up a different point. Let me just make this, and that, uh, uh, is I don't believe, whatever Democrats and Republicans run on, I don't believe there is going to be a national policy effort to make dramatic changes in American healthcare. I think we're done for a generation. No president is going to want to spend that much political capital. President Obama spent almost all of his political capital on this. I think all of the innovation around healthcare delivery reform, payment reform, coverage reform is going to come from states. That's where it's going to come from. So I think states are going to be very interesting to watch over the next few years. All right. Um, I'm happy to keep going. I just want to make look that we're at 6.30. A couple more minutes. Do you want me to stop? What would you, you're the MC. What would you like? Um, one more question. One more question, then I'll be happy to st I'll stay down here. OK, you pick. Who would you like? <laughs> What's going on in Germany? <laughs> you should be up here. You want to trade? We have a pretty good health care system. You do, but um, utilizing a but lot. Still, I'm quite interested in uh, your opinion on what we could learn from the American system. What could we implement in our system to make it even better? So um, I think American, the American health care delivery system is the most innovative system in the world right now. The experiments we're doing with bundle payments, accountable care organizations, readmissions, value-based payments, 
it's super interesting. And places like the UK, places, places like Germany, are actually experimenting with a lot of the same things, trying to learn from the US. So it's interesting, because we have this idea of, oh, America's got it wrong, everybody else has got it right. And it turns out it's more complicated than that. So I think when it comes to delivery innovation, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening here um, that everybody can learn from, including us. All right, well, with that, let me say thank you for a very engaging discussion. This was great, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ja. And now I'd like to invite you all to the reception, the Garland reception on the fifth floor of the Countway in the Leahy Room. Thank you.